Uh, this talk is a uh, harder, better, faster, stronger semi-auto vulnerability research. If uh, that's not the talk you were expecting to be, stay here anyway. It'll be good. Uh, Lorene Grenier manages the analyst research team for Sourcefire and is also an active developer on the Metasploit project. Richard Johnson is the primary research engineer also at Sourcefire. So, guys. Turn myself on here. There we go. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. All right. So um, we're in the programmatic track, I guess. Is there a fuzzing track? I think there is, right? I haven't even looked at the schedule. I'm going to assume so. Um, so we're not here today to talk to you specifically about fuzzers. Um, and we are not here today to talk to you specifically about tooling, although fuzzers and some tooling are going to feature pretty heavily today. Um, what we are here to talk to you about is industrialization. Okay. So. Right now in vulnerability discovery, we've kind of got two ends of the spectrum, right? We've got people who are digging through code, doing reverse engineering, or fuzzing to find that very specific, unique snowflake of a bug that works for them and makes them happy, and they can develop to an exploit and make somebody look bad or whatever else they feel like doing with it. Um, on the other side, we've got people who are finding tons and tons and tons of vulnerabilities, not having the time to give them the attention that they deserve, toss them on a thumb drive, handing them out to people, doing whatever, giving them to vendors, right? Um, but we want to kind of go the other way around. So what we'd like to do here is find a whole bunch of bugs and then give them all the attention that they deserve um, kind of in an industrialization type of way, right? So uh, when people started building cars, they would build an individual car, they'd sell it to a single person, they'd go back and build another car. How many orders they got, they didn't know. How many cars they were going to build in a set amount of time, not really sure. They were nice cars, but they're only building one, right? What we kind of like to do here is uh, add sort of an assembly line around our fuzzing process, our bug discovery process, and turn each of those bugs into a BMW, which is, of course, mass produced, but it's still worth 40K, and it's going to make somebody very, very happy at the end of the day, right? So, where are we right now? Um, currently, we know that finding bugs is not the problem. Fuzzing works. Everybody knows fuzzing works. Everybody's finding bugs with fuzzing. You can find bugs with very simple, very stupid fuzzers. You can find bugs with very complicated, uh, you know, generation fuzzers, like Microsoft's bugs there, like JS Fun Fuzz, which is, you know, uh, pretty intelligent. So you can find a whole ton of bugs. That's not a big deal. Okay. Um, we have tools to work for on this problem. We have distributed fuzzing. People have done this before. Um, and we have pretty solid crash analysis. Right now, you're seeing a lot of taint tracking stuff come up. Um, you're seeing a lot of tooling around the triage side. right? Um, but our main problem here is that we have no workflow. We have no process for doing this. Okay? Um, and what we'd like to do here is apply a workflow to both generation and, more often, dumb fuzzing so that what we end up with is a consistent flow of vulnerabilities, um, and we save human time doing it. Okay? So that's our primary goal. Okay? We want to have uh, a full pipeline. Okay? So we're not coming at this from the standpoint of a vendor who creates software, who needs to find all the bugs in their product to be secure. Um, and we're not coming at it from a researcher who needs to find one or two very interesting bugs uh, to kind of add to the, the what am I looking for? The zeitgeist, right? To, to push things forward. What we'd really like to get here is a consistent flow of vulnerabilities that we can consistently exploit for cash flow to attack a target. And the targets that we're looking at are dictated by the marketplace and by the environment. Okay? So our secondary goals are pretty simple. Okay? Uh, we need to know something about that vulnerability, so there's going to have to be some triage afterwards. Uh, and we want to have a good human time efficiency rating. Okay? So we don't want to waste people's time doing this. We've got a limited workforce, um, and we want to make sure that they're working efficiently to get what we need. So, I can find a whole bunch of very interesting bugs that take a very long time to triage and a very long time to exploit, and I can hand them to my exploitation team, and it's going to take them a long time. They'll get them done. 
but those are really bad ROI bugs, right? They're not the bugs that are going to get us the cash flow we want, get us in and out of uh, enemy systems the way we want, okay? Secondarily, we want to have some CPU efficiency, and we have to have some ease of use, okay? CPU efficiency, very much secondary to human efficiency, um, but we'll see in a second that it's still very important in bug finding. So this is going to be our basic workflow. Um, and as you can see there, we've got three in gray, tax surface analysis, input selection, fuzzing, okay? And those are separated from our triage set. Um, and one of the things that we think is very, very important here is to separate that triage from the bug discovery, okay? Uh, right now, you'll see a lot of people saying, two years ago, I fuzzed such and such a thing and I found no bugs. That doesn't make any sense to me because it's a singular action, I fuzzed, right? What you have to do is continuously fuzz all the time and separate your bug triage from that. So it's not like you fuzz and then you triage. You are always fuzzing and you are always triaging, okay? So what you'd really like to see up there is kind of a circle of attack surface analysis, input selection and fuzzing, and triage is a separate thing done by a separate group of people afterwards, okay? And what we're gonna try to do is figure out what we need to do to facilitate that continuous cycle of fuzzing and facilitate the separate triage from a different group. Okay. So um, as has been pointed out a few times, the most important, important factor in our bug discovery is going to be our input selection, right? Um, we don't want to have fuzzing be an active thing. It's gotta be passive, okay? So what we need to do is have a very easy way to bring CPUs into this. We have to be able to continuously add targets. We need to be able to continuously update what we're gonna fuzz when those targets change, things like that. We want it to be very simple because, as I've learned, if you have a large group of CPUs or you want to share CPUs with somebody else um, and you don't make it very, very simple, it's not gonna happen, okay? People are gonna take their machines back from you um, they're not going to set things up at night to do the fuzzing that you've asked them to do. Um, so ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is hand someone a VM and say, every night when you go home from work, hit the play button. Every day when you come in in the morning, hit the pause button. End of story, we're all done, okay? So it's gotta be completely automated on that side. Okay, so um, while we're doing this fuzzing in a continuous fashion, we'd like to be able to triage in a totally separate area. Okay, so when we do this triage, we don't want to triage every single bug. Okay, we want to be able to select for our understanding of the bug. And we'll talk about a little bit more on what that means and how it changes over time a little bit later when we really get into it. But um, what we'd ideally like to be able to do is get all the data we can out of the original crash so we're not replicating work and have enough data for somebody to be able to say, I'm interested in type of bug X, Y, and Z. I understand it. I can work with it easily within my group. Let's go there and get all those bugs out of the database as they've been changing over time and go off and do our triage process, okay? So um, as far as attack service analysis goes, um, what we need to do here is, especially for our dumb fuzzing, um, we need to be able to understand how much code coverage we're getting because that's our most important uh, area. So um, we've got some tooling around this that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, um, but this is absolutely our first step, okay? If we don't know how much code coverage we're getting, we're gonna be wasting a lot of CPU time. So uh, I would like to introduce the Miller theorem. I guess uh, he's a doctor, he should probably have a theorem. I don't think he has a theorem yet, so I decided to give him one. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, as code path co coverage goes up, you get more bugs. As the time spent fuzzing goes up, you get more bugs, right? Pretty simple here, more code coverage, more bugs. And so um, that comes down to our, our CPU efficiency. So obviously we can add CPUs very easily, it's really cheap to do that, but our main problem here is that if we're not efficient in it, that time spent fuzzing is going to go down no matter how many CPUs we have we're reproducing work, so it's not useful, right? It doesn't actually go into the theorem because it's reproduced. Okay. 
So how do we obey that theorem? We have to be able to easily, in an automated fashion, uh, select inputs to maximize code coverage. Um, and we have to easily set up a framework that maximizes uptime. Okay? And those are going to be our two goals when we, when we build our tooling here. So we've been talking a lot about uh, mutation as something that's very human efficient, right? Um, but of course you can do both, right? Um, as you set up the first cycle of your, your mutation fuzzing, the people who set up your mutation fuzzer, who are starting to understand this format, need to begin building templates for their generation fuzzing, right? And those templates you're building for generation are going to be pushed back into your data set for triage later on. But there's no reason not to start mutation fuzzing while you're developing templates for generation fuzzing, right? There's absolutely no reason to not to do it. Um, it's been proven very, very recently that you can find a ton of bugs with very simple mutation fuzzing. And further, you can prove very easily that you're not reproducing work when you're doing mutation fuzzing, right? Um, I can take my sample set, I can find my code path coverage, and I know that I'm exercising certain code paths and I can stick to those, right? And it also means that um, later on, when I'd like to retest code when things change, I can go back to the same test cases for my mutation fuzzing and get that done very efficiently. So um, we really want to get away from that fuzzing as a single thing as opposed to uh, an ongoing process. Um, and, and the illustration of our ongoing process is essentially that we're going to run our tests. We're going to collect all the data for it. As things update and change, we're going to retest. And uh, we're talking about retesting and things changing. We're talking about patching new versions of software, um, being able to easily determine what's changed and go back and cover all of those different code paths as they come up. Okay, so um, the, the vast amount of time that we spend in fuzzing is gonna be in the actual test execution itself, right? Um, so we'd, we'd really rather not do a bunch of tests, collect some crashes, and then go back and do more testing on that to figure out what's important about it. What we'd like to do is catch everything that we can possibly catch that's important at that time, because that's going to be the majority of our time spent. So um, we'll talk about how to decide what we're going to grab and what's absolutely necessary to grab when we get into an implementation of the workflow. Um, but for right now, what I'd like to just say is that you don't really want to run your tests in a vacuum. You want to have them be watched by something, right? Custom debugger, something like that. Okay. Uh, in order to make all this happen very easily, we're going to be required to, to distribute well, and so we're going to be required to have some sort of centralized management. Okay. And we'll look at what we need in the centralized management, what we should be storing, how to distribute pretty easily. Um, another thing that you'll see is uh, people grab a whole bunch of crashes. Um, they end up with crash dumps. They store their data like that, just kind of sitting around. Very, very difficult to get through. Uh, and for the triage group, it's going to come back and look at this stuff. It's really not useful at all. So what we're going to try to do here is store all of the data that we possibly can in a searchable database that we never, ever get rid of. Okay. Storage is cheap. We want to store it forever because, as we'll see, you really never know what's going to be exploitable tomorrow. So a lot of the, the, the time you'll see the very first thing somebody does is go through and pull out all the null pointer dereferences. Throw them away, they're not useful, right? So if you get rid of all of those, you spent a five month fuzzing project, you get rid of all those crashes, tomorrow, Dowd comes over with a paper that says, ah, all the null pointer dereferences in action script are exploitable through this, 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 and technique, you don't have them anymore. It's a lot nicer to be able to go back to your database and say, find me all the null pointer dereferences that have these properties uh, in this program between these versions where this vulnerable uh, code path is accessible, get the whole list, and send it off to the person on your exploitation team that just went and took his class, right? That person can work on it pretty efficiently, and those bugs that you would have thrown out normally uh, are now very, very useful to you. So when we do our storage, um, 
there's a couple things we need to store. Uh, we're going to have to store all of the data that will be necessary for crash selection or for crash searching. And then we're going to store all the data that's free. Okay? There's some data that we'd really, really like, but it takes a long time to get. That's data we're going to push till after crash selection. But we'll take everything we can get because we don't know what's going to be useful at this time. Uh, another thing that we're going to store in that database is the code path coverage of our initial test program or our initial test input. Um, and then we're going to store the code graphs for the program that we're fuzzing. So the reason we're going to do that is so that we can easily go back and automate this retesting later and know what tests to go through without going through the input selection. Um, and in this way, you can pretty much automate all that stuff. Another neat thing that you can do is, is track bug life across different software versions. So if what you're looking for is a bug to sell to somebody who is very concerned with having a bug live a long time, um, you can automatically search your database for bugs that live in code paths that have been recently patched um, but were still not found. Because odds are those code paths won't be covered again in an audit very soon. So um, again, the question is, which crashes do we go and add extra triage information to later on, right? And the answer is, um, we're only going to go back and triage the crashes that we understand, OK? So if you have a guy that's uh, really amazing at doing uh, low fragmentation, heap, uh, metadata, chunk exploitation, which probably nobody does, but if you did, you'd want to be able to go and find those bugs. So you'd have to be able to search your database and find the bugs that fall into that category, that crash in that specific way, to hand off to that guy. If you pull on a new group of people that have a new specialty or new research comes out and somebody understands it, you want to be able to search for those bugs and hand it off. So the bugs that we find interesting absolutely will change over time. Okay. So in addition as part, as part of the uh, triage process, of course, um, once we get all of these, these data sources back, um, the first thing you're going to need to do is some exception analysis. So if, if your goal is to put the people that are capable of exploiting certain classes of bugs and getting that data into their hands, well, then obviously the first thing you need to do is a little bit of automated exception analysis. And, um, you know, obviously we have some tools like Crash Wrangler or Bang Exploitable. They'll tell you if it's a read AV or write AV. Um, I believe that tooling can do better um, as we get towards data flow analysis and taint tracking. Um, we'll be able to understand, you know, is this data used further on? Um, if we can apply constraint solving, things along those lines. These are things that we haven't implemented yet, but are part of the process at the end of the day. There are papers out there that discuss these parts of the, the uh, triage process. And as part of that, um, there's other things to consider. For example, in Adobe, they use a custom memory allocator. So you may have a guy who's a little fresh off the, uh, the new VulnDev pile, but uh, you know, if he doesn't quite understand how to exploit the latest Windows 7 heat management, um, he may be able to understand something like Adobe's heat manager, and you can specialize on that. The data that we're going to need is uh, flows of execution, um, flows of data propagation within the memory space of the program. Um, to get the code execution, what we're looking for is code coverage. And that comes from a simple block hit trace. The execution order of the blocks infer the uh, actual graph edges. And so you take a simple block hit trace, obviously tie up those edges, and now you have a presentable graph. You can use those runtime graphs to overlay static graphs because, of course, when we're dealing with uh, C++ or other languages that um, compile in a lot of indirect function calls, you're not going to be able to see the entire attack surface initially or see what uh, code paths could have reached this vulnerable function without overlaying that data. We also are going to want to hook the APIs that have to do with uh, user I.O. So um, in the case of Windows, you might be hooking open file, read file, um, map view of section, et cetera. Um, and, this, and on the Linux side, the system calls are similar, and map, read. And we want to 
mark the data that comes in from those calls um, as it gets propagated into memory so that we can watch future reads and writes to those address spaces, build a data flow um, dependency graph, and then follow the actual taint propagation through that graph. Um, and the whole point of doing taint analysis, if it's unfamiliar to you, is to understand what parts of memory were actually touched by these external uh, I.O. APIs. So if there's potential um, data flow coming from a read file, and you have identified that read file is reading from a file descriptor that is supplied by the user, well, obviously, the data that propagates from there is, is very interesting. That's data that can be modified and manipulated and uh, may be used in this crash. Um, and at the, at the end of the day, we've seen like the, automa the automated uh, exploit generation paper came out last year, I think. Um, that we, we work in the business of writing IDS signatures, and so some of the analysts on our team hopefully can benefit from this type of work because the bytes that were involved in the crash are obviously the bytes that you're going to be looking for in an IDS signature off the wire. And then finally, as part of our process, we need to make this easy to use, like we said. So one way to do that, since we're collecting these giant data sets, I mean, millions upon millions of locations and memory that were modified by user data, um, hundreds of thousands of blocks or functions that were executed, we need a way to be able to understand this data effectively. And putting it in a spreadsheet just isn't gonna do it. So it's common, of course, to use something like IDA and, and look at graphs, and we've developed some of our own uh, graph visualization. And uh, a couple years ago, I did some research a little deeper on visualization, and you know, there's a lot of scientific studies out there that just say that if uh, the human brain is most acclimated to understanding large amounts of data through, through vision, so it only makes sense to try to put problems of complex data association into a, a visual context. So in order to achieve some of these goals, we've started to write a tool set. Um, not all of the goals that I've mentioned have been implemented, but this is a process, and along with the process, it would be kind of useless if there weren't effective tools to implement part of that process. So I have a tool set called MoFlow. And uh, this is the general architecture diagram. It's a series of libraries. It spans several languages from, uh, I use an, an external disassembler library written in assembler itself to C Sharp UI, C++ wrappers and whatnot. This architecture isn't all that important to remember right now, but what is kind of interesting is that we are able to coalesce all of this data into a database or data source and then make it accessible from several different areas. Like the fuzzer that we use takes advantage of some of the uh, flow coverage as we select which files to fuzz. Also, um, we have a WinDebug plugin that can take if you've ever tried to get a call graph in Windebug, it doesn't exist. They are able to show you a, a, a function disassembly that's broken up by blocks, but they don't actually have an internal representation of the program graph. So by taking some of this data that we extract and putting it into Windebug, you also have a more effective tooling while you're actually actively debugging the scenario. <clears throat> and here's just a little screen capture. I'm gonna show a live demo. Um, was this the... Are we gonna do the demo here after the input selection? Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into this in a minute, but here's a general concept of, this is the kind of easy to use interface you're looking for. You wanna be able to navigate the graph, um, select some input files that you're interested in, collect data about those input files, and um, intelligently be able to determine how to begin your fuzzing process and when you find crashes, how to triage that. Like I said, we'll demo that here in a little bit. First, we should talk a little bit more about the requirements and the implementation of what we're working with. So one of the things that was mentioned is attack surface analysis. You know, that's a, um, a term that more or less refers to understanding the subset of the code that is actually exposed to external data input. So, um, you know, in the case of a UI program, a good large percentage of that is all user interaction related through the UI. It's probably not the types of uh, code that we're interested in for looking for network or file-based vulnerabilities. So we need to initially be able to look at the old program, call graph, do some reachability analysis on it, determine which APIs we uh, believe are important, whether they be system calls themselves that take the I.O., or they be wrappers that we define as uh, driver interfaces or um, you know, wrapper functions and DLLs, for example, and coalesce that down into an interesting area of the program that we're looking for. Uh, next, we need to be able to do an efficient, dynamic trace of the potential input files that we're interested in. Um, 
you know, a lot of people use external tools like uh, that are based on WinDebug, such as PyMe, PyDebug, Process Docker, whatever it might be. Um, the debugging engine is, is a great thing, but it's not the most efficient way to trace a program. So we work towards making a more efficient tracer so that when you have a set of 1,000 templates and you're curious which one of these you should start fuzzing to make your fuzzing process efficient, well, every time you increase, like, by about a factor of 10 to 20, that's 10 or 20 more template files you're getting through every couple of seconds, you know? So obviously when we talk about efficiency, the base recording tools and, and the base analysis needs to be as efficient as possible. Um, and then obviously as part of the input selection, we want to be able to have an interface that shows some form of comparison after you've traced all these files and says, hey, you know, we have this attack surface that we're trying to get to, that we're trying to um, cover. How many of these files actually hit the areas that we're interested in? Or let's say you know about a vulnerability um, in a specific structure in a file, and so you add the function that parses that structure to your attack surface, and you say, we actually are interested in not just the overall attack surface, but specifically files in our data set that will hit this area of code. So that's what we're looking for in template ranking. You know, how, uh, do we have templates that are even going to exercise the area that we're interested in, and how much are they going to exercise? Um, so in order to get that attack surface analysis, um, in that architecture graph, one of the things that was listed was a library, libcodis, and it's um, just a wrapper around a disassembler library that is able to construct uh, call graphs and control flow graphs. And um, of course, you can use IDA. I've written an IDA script that works on all the versions, so you don't need to have a commercial version, but it exports the important parts of the, the graphs and um, the function, the, the calls and um, block edges and whatnot. And then, of course, you need to define the APIs. And like I said, there's a set of APIs that will be related to the system functionality, but also sometimes when you open a large program, like let's say Adobe, you know, most of that code is executing in a 20 megabyte DLL, Adobe Reader 32, and there are no calls out to open file, read file, et cetera. Those are all wrappered. So you need to be able to understand at least your, your input enough to, um, to associate the wrapper function with that. And that can be done through dynamic tracing as well. If you do put a hook on read file, and you only actually are interested in where does the execution path get back into this DLL that we're interested in fuzzing, you know, then it can automatically identify this is your exposed APIs. Of course, that's limited through dynamic tracing, and you're not going to get it all at once, but you can merge these graphs. Um, so reachability is a problem. So if, if you're going to uh, determine which functions on this call graph are actually reachable from an input source or from a uh, taint, API, uh, attack surface API, then you need an efficient way to do it. There's a algorithm that comes from uh, civil engineering, actually, or some other discipline that I, that I came across, and they were doing uh, network graph analysis in a completely different context, where they're interested in relationships of pressure points or something like that in a, in a construction building. Well, we can use that same thing to understand, you know, is this point on the graph influenced by this other point on the graph? That's exactly what they were doing in a physical context, but we're doing it in an abstract context on, on computer programs. The algorithm's pretty simple. You just keep a, you have your full list of what's in the graph, and you have a work list of which nodes you're interested in. You throw your APIs that you're beginning with into that graph, and then you iterate. So every time you look at all the edges out of that node that you initially put in there, if there's an edge, then you add the node that it's attached to back into that graph, if it's not already been analyzed. So Pretty straightforward. It's people talk about reachability all the time, and sometimes it's like, how do I do that? It's it's not too difficult. Um, the template code coverage continues on with instrumenting each basic block in the program. And like I said, the debug engine isn't the best way to go. I use Pin, uh, the Pin Tool framework. Um, it's similar to Dynamo Rio. It's a just-in-time compilation, more or less, of native executables. It's got its own loading. It uh, caches the functions. Um, every time they're referenced, it pulls it out of the cache, uh, allows you to install hook, uh, hook functions and, and um, inject uh, you know, callbacks after reads, writes, calls, whatever it is that you're interested in. But um, you'll see I have some stats coming up, I think, on the efficiency of that. And uh, yeah, and I guess the only other important part of that is you know, file I.O. So when you're tracing, if you've 
written this efficient tracer or, this, or on top of an efficient tracing framework and you're dumping out to a file every time, well, you just reduce that efficiency. So, you know, being smart about how you manage memory, how you manage your logs, you know, what happens when an exception occurs and you're holding all your data in a ring buffer and you just miss the last, you know, several function calls, you know, just how to handle that smartly. And that's a tool that we'll be giving away, um, the tracing stuff. Um, this is kind of the interface you can launch from within the program that I'm about to show you. Uh, that allows you to just run the traces dynamically, collect all that data, push it back into the program. And like I said, this, the speed advantage. Um, I mentioned Process Docker just because it's something I actually helped work on a long time ago. Um, but it's a debug engine based, anything that's debug engine based. Um, I was doing a, a very non-scientific benchmark, just doing several iterations over a zip compression algorithm. And um, it just shows you that, you know, in this specific instance, it was about 12 times faster just compressing the same file about a hundred times. <clears throat> and uh, so the final process is ultimately to select the functions for your attack surface, calculate the reachability in, in this UI, and rank those traces. And I think we're about ready for a demo here. We're gonna go ahead and start a new project here. Aha, good point. Lorraine tells me that you guys can't actually see this. That, that's, that's, that's valid. <laughs> All right, well you guys don't get to see my nifty little splash screen here, but here we go. That's my job now, I just manage. <laughs> difficult okay I didn't actually expect for this not to be mirrored but okay so we've got a, a new project and what we're looking for is that 7-zip module which we have here so uh, it detects whether or not there's been a database already uh, accumulated by CODIS or um, exported from IDA and so just to uh, be time efficient we'll do that and uh, Actually, let's go ahead and load some traces so I can show you the full functionality here. Um, so I see, yeah. Okay. So we've added a few traces that I've previously collected. I'll, I'll show you. You can actually launch traces from within here too. But for our demo, I want to show you the difference in a trace that has. Uh, you know, different sets of code coverage and things like that, so. Um, so we have our, our module here. And, uh, okay. So there's some uh, configurability in my graph set up here. This is an open source control that does the actual rendering. Everything else is code that I've written. Um, so let's see, we're gonna start. So we're going to be interested in, in things like, uh, did this specific, do, does this program have a reference to read file in it, right? So let's go find out if there's a reference to read file. All right, so unfortunately the resolution here is a little going to be tough to deal with, but um, so what we have here is all calls, gosh, it's going to look great on video, by the way. Um, all right, well, so statically, yes, read file is referenced in there. Now let's check out if uh, this is a trace that basically just ran a usage statement. So we're going to ensure that, you know, this doesn't have a reference. <laughs> oh, demos.
Woo. <laughs> uh, clever. All right. <laughs> I won't waste too much more of your time if this doesn't work out right, because this is very, very difficult to do here anyway. But this, this is, this is the uh, easy to use interface that uh, <laughs> allows you to go ahead and you know, add modules, traces, compare them. I just want to do this one more time so I can show you the ranking. That's most, mostly one of the important parts. So you did see that the, it has some graphs uh, prepared here. If we want to go ahead and do some diffs on these coverages, uh, you can see that these two actually are kind of both the same execution. They're just like a, a usage statement. This, this one is uh, zipping a file using the compression uh, program. And so um, you can see here that this would be the location where you would say, out of that attack surface, I'm not sure if I showed you that part yet. So out of this attack surface, I don't have any nifty uh, please wait indicators coming up yet. Oh, this is why. So when you select attack surface, it asks you which functions you're interested in. And so uh, these are just kind of standard set of Windows APIs. Go ahead and open that. All right, so now we can see. Uh, Why is this not? Gosh, I really can't see that too well. Um, yeah, it's a little bit better. So if we want to see all every, everything that eventually leads to a read file being called, for example. Sorry. Callers is what we're looking for. Um, then you know you can look at your your uh, trace file here. If you want to overlay that trace with some of this runtime data, um, so we're curious what exactly in this program was touched after that read file was uh, executed. This will take just a second. How are we doing on time since I crashed there? Okay, so now you can see that that static. Uh, the attack surface graph, which showed all calls that would reach read file, these are the blocks that were executed during the execution of the program that led to or from any other function that were, was touching read file. So essentially, this is the expanded attack surface of the program after you have taken into account the runtime data, um, the indirect calls, things like that. So you're gonna use this data, once again, to select which one of these files, you know, of course we can, here, let's do this real quick. We can uh, go ahead and run a bunch more. Oh, you know what, first I gotta do this. I gotta add some input files that we're interested in. So, all right, so got some input files. Then when we go ahead and uh, run those, and this is gonna run via pin, um, using my plugin here. And uh, so this is collecting, again, this is collecting code coverage. Uh, of course, it's gonna show you on this window. It's launching it and running it on this window and not gonna allow me to interact with it, I don't think. Uh, yeah, you can see it running. So it's throwing those up. You can actually determine, or you can decide whether or not you wanna hide that in the background or not. Just for the demo, I thought you guys might wanna see it. So it's running these traces. It'll finish up here in just a moment. It's actually quite fast, which is why I wanted to show you. But okay, so it's ran all those. And now we have these added here. And um, if we did another trace ranking, those would show up to basically be nothing because they're just an empty zip file. But from here, uh, we will go jump back in um, because at this point you would select one of those traces. All right, select one of those traces for going into the fuzzing automation portion. 
I apologize that entire time I was not looking at you all. <laughs> all right, so um, what we're going to talk about now is um, how to automate the actual creation of your tests and the running of your tests after you've decided uh, what you're going to start and use as input files to those tests. So um, the stuff that Rich looked at just now and, and the stuff that we're going to talk about is kind of mutation centric, but um, a lot of it applies to generation too. So, uh, where did my cursor go? Yeah, I go left. There we go. Yeah. All right, so um, each of the tests that we're going to run are, are very atomic, right? Um, it's very easy to either generate all the tests if we're doing um, generation on one machine and push them out to other machines, or we can actually push out the generation to different machines and do the testing there as well. Um, it's easy to add systems to this, and it's actually easy to add tests and new input files to this on the fly as well. Um, so we're going to make use of that centralized management to get there, and, and I'll show you that in just a sec. So um, when we're managing our actual run test cases, um, there are many benefits to actually running these in, in a debugger. Um, the first is that it allows us to do some very interesting things like um, we can add interesting debugging technologies that don't take up too much time. Like page people run not inside a debugger, but um, there are other technologies that won't, that, that need some instrumentation. So um, if we build a debugger to wrap these things and watch them at all times, we can add in some of that um, not terribly too intrusive uh, instrumentation to try to get some more data out. Um, we can take a look at first chance exceptions that may have been handled by a piece of software that are still an indicator of some sort of problem that we'd want to take a look at, depending on what operating system you're using. Um, and we want to make sure that, that uh, again, our ease of use here is paramount. So recovering dead hosts has got to be very easy. Um, adding new hardware has got to be very easy. And making, uh, making use of the database, the data that comes in there from these hosts has got to be very, very easy. So we're going to hold all of these things in the central database that Rich showed with the, uh, the MoFlow graph earlier. We're going to show or store the job details, um, all the code coverage graphs, um, the test cases as they're created, um, successful crashes along with all of the data that's very simple to get um, and we'll, we actually store that in an XML uh, database that is then pulled into the triage code that we'll, we'll talk about in a second. So uh, the basic flow is pretty much like this. Um, there's job collection where you'll get, as a, as a debugging host, you'll get um, either a file that's already been created for you or an input that's already been created for you to hand to the process, or you'll get a description of how to create that. Um, this will be handed to your fuzzing engine, um, which should be interchangeable. So uh, in our case, we pull in a DLL, and that'll tell you that that DLL uh, gets a script that tells it how to do the mutation or how to do the generation or what needs to happen, and then it'll spawn two threads. One is going to be uh, the debugging test thread, which is watched with um, the debug extension stuff, um, and another is going to be a CPU monitor to decide when we're done looking at this thing. Um, and in the case of a crash, uh, we're going to do our data collection using our CODIS disassembly and uh, basic Windows debug extensions. And then we're going to report that back to the database using a simple curl line. It just goes to a uh, web interface to the database, stores it all up there, and it'll show it to you later. So uh, what kind of data are we going to gather here? Um, we absolutely, absolutely, absolutely must store enough data to bucket our crashes. People have talked about bucketing before. It is not an option. It is absolutely necessary. Okay. Secondarily, we need to be able to have some sort of categorization for that bug. Um, where did it crash? What did it look like? Um, is it in a write violation or a read? Um, and what does the block of code look like around it? If I have a read violation, that might not be very interesting, but it's a read violation that I'm then going into an object and pulling out a function pointer and making use of that. It's probably used after free, and I really want to know that. So I want to be able to see the whole block, not just where it crashed. 
Um, and we're going to store everything that we can get. So everything that we can possibly think of to pull out that's very simple, that's on the tip of the debugger at the time, we're going to store all that in our XML. We're going to toss that into our database. Because as we said, we really have no idea what's going to be important later on. Okay. So we've got that, that, uh, that rotating work going on, creating our fuzzing. Our second part is our completely separate team, which is the triage team. Um, and they're going to be mining crashes out of this database that we've set up for them. Okay? They're going to decide what's relevant to them as far as targets right now, as far as uh, their knowledge. Pick out the crashes from the database with searches, um, which you can separate through any of the fields that we pull. And then mine them out for, for going into triage. Like I mentioned before, very hard to exploit bugs are very awesome, but they're really bad ROI. We want to keep our pipeline full for as many people as we have doing exploit development, doing triage. Um, but we want them to also have a good output. So we want to smartly pick what we're pulling out to triage. So that's kind of a tiny screenshot because we're at a horrible uh, projector up there. But that's our basic web interface. Um, so you can see you've got the instruction. You've got all of your your registers. Um, for any crash bucket that you have, you can pull down the XML that was set up there. You can pull down the sample. Um, and Rich's triage code will go up there and automatically um, put in its search, find a set of them, pull all the XML and all the samples out, and then it can do the tracing on it. Um, and he'll show you that right now. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't have a uh, graphical representation. I don't have a uh, graphical representation of the data flow analysis because at the end of the day, it's um, the code's going to be out there, the pin flow module that I wrote. Um, more or less so, in pin flow, uh, you, know, you have several locations where you can hook. So when you need to get to the point of determining things along the lines of exploitability, triggering conditions, root cause, code coverage isn't going to cut it. You're going to need to understand a little bit more about where data specifically flowed, which instructions, uh, were operating on that and whether or not there was a dependency chain um, when memory was moved from one dereference into a register and then back out into memory. So the things that we're looking for in triage is whether or not the specific bug that we found is exploitable. Now obviously if you're crashing on a you know, call to a bad memory location, that's pretty safe to say it's exploitable, um, assuming that you have some control over that value. Um, but if we want to determine more specifically, uh, we have a read AV, and we need to understand which bytes of this uh, value were interacted with by user data, then we need to take it a little bit further. And in order to do that, we will rerun, taking that XML information from Lorraine's um, online fuzzing tool, uh, we'll take that exception information, feed that back into the tracer, and say, OK, instead of doing an efficient uh, code coverage trace, this time we're going to need to do some additional tracing going to hook every memory read-write access and log that all to a file for later analysis. That same data can be used to uh, locate the triggering condition. Now, in our situation, in this specific case, where we're doing fuzzing, mutation fuzzing, we actually know the input. So we, we know that we modified this byte in this file, and it led to this crash. So in the context of fuzzing and, and finding new crashes, it's less important to understand the triggering condition um, there are people that are doing research out there right now that, you know, you'll generate, the, uh, JS FunFuzz, for example, will generate a huge JavaScript file. It, it, uh, they implemented a BNF grammar for the JavaScript language, which means that they were able to abstract the interactions between uh, the objects and, and the functions that are available in JavaScript so that they know that this function uses this type of object and now you can mutate it all around and anything that outputs this type of object can now be fed back into that function, et cetera. So at the end of the day, they end up with a 100-line JavaScript file. They have no idea what it really does, and it might lead to a crash. Some people have been developing things that, one by one, take out a line of that, rerun it, see if it still crashes, you know, try to determine it that way. There is better ways to do it through tan analysis. And uh, so if you were dealing with an external crash, um, you know, if you have a, a bug that you need to triage that's as part of your vulnerability development process that somebody submitted to you, then finding the triggering condition is much more important. And so um, taint analysis is another part 
triggering condition analysis and can be achieved through TAIN analysis and is also part of the triage process. And then finally, um, without doing any additional work on top of that, you can also help understand root cause. If you have uh, several bugs that are ending in the same EIP location but uh, have exercised different code paths or the vice versa where you have several different crashes but when you overlay the graphs you notice that oh, they all originate from a higher level point uh, in the graph, then perhaps you should look a little bit closer at the interaction going on there to determine if that's actually where the bug was introduced and then later as that structure was accessed throughout the program, then it will crash. As far as getting the exception information, it's pretty straightforward. Um, brute file, again, uses some of the libcodis data to be able to disassemble the program uh, at the location of the crash and just packages that nicely into an XML format or can also push it into a database. And uh, at that point, you would open back up that MoFlow visualizer and say, this crash is interesting. Um, let's go ahead and start working on uh, locating the graphs that are interacting with this location where the exception occurred and also rerun that same exact file to produce the same exact crash, hopefully, um, but this time with data flow. Um, so yeah, I, I more or less already mentioned this, but more uh, the blocks that are hooked will also inject instruction callbacks after every read or write operation to get the data flow. And that's output into a huge log file. I mean, every single read or write instruction is recorded with the register values uh, realized and um, from there, you go through a process of building a hierarchy and dependency. So you would, you would actually get all the data flow from the moment that the program was loaded into the memory space. So first, you need to locate those APIs again that we're interested in, those attack surface APIs. And specifically, you're looking for the time that that API was called with the file that you know that you gave to the program to cause a crash. From there, you begin to follow this graph of dependency um, and build more or less a, a lot, what a lot of people call shadow memory. It's, there's a couple of ways to do it, but shadow memory is a, a pretty straightforward way where you're representing each byte of memory or each bit of memory in your own private copy. Um, by doing that, every time an address is overwritten, it's determined whether or not that address had dependencies upon it and that would be wiped out. Or if it's overwritten, then the dependencies from the source will be copied to that overwritten value. And this is stuff that uh, we have in kind of really proof of concept stage. So um, this will be something that we're going to be releasing in the following months. That I believe we're going to be packaging these tools separately and, and trying to release them one at a time so that you guys can get an overall idea of how the internals work and adapt them to your own environments. Finally, the uh, triggering conditions. Um, the, as, I, as I already mentioned, the brute file will tell us the modifications that it did. Um, with the taint analysis, you can also determine if you, if you find the location of the code that led to the crash, well, obviously, then you'll know the byte offset that was propagated from that original file read down to the location that it crashes at. I kind of covered a lot of this in that first slide. So, yeah, just by overlaying traces um, and understanding whether or not the traces originate from, a, contain the same subgraph. You can think of it this way. If the traces that lead to an exception contain the same subgraph leading up to that exception, or different exceptions contain the same subgraph at a higher point that comes from that data flow source, then it may be a cause to look into root cause analysis. And this is an important part in software development shops. When I used to work at Microsoft, obviously if we put out a point fix in a DLL, you know, the community is very quick to point that out for us and let us know that, oh, there is this other corner case and it could go down this other path and still exploit that same bug. So root cause analysis is less of a concern for people that are trying to generate bugs for um, profit and more for people who are trying to defend software and secure the code that they have. And then I mentioned that we do have some plugins to other tools. Um, just. Uh, We've got a console disassembler and library that allows you to utilize all of the graph analysis that we have. Um, and a WinDebug plugin um, also utilizes DML. I don't know if you guys are aware of DML, but it's the uh, debugger markup language. It's uh, basically it's hypertext that's within the debugger output window. And when you click on it, it can execute other debugger commands. And it looks something like this. 
So we've just got basically the access to the call graph from within there. Um, when you want you, that cross-referencing, uh, outputs dot format, but now we'll obviously we'll output stuff that goes back into my code. And here's an example output with the type of uh, disassembler that you would expect from something like IDA. And IDC is there. I, I hear that we're running out of time, so if you guys have any questions, we'd love to take those now. If there's no questions, uh, you guys can reach us later um, via email or Twitter. And we'd like to thank Chris McBee, who was a big help on the fuzzing interface, the web distributed fuzzing. And all the database stuff. And all the database stuff, yes. All right, thank you very much.